Thank you very much, Duncan. It's a pleasure to be back with this group. In fact, uh, Duncan informs me that I am uh, the most frequent speaker in, in the long and august history of this group, which I feel is like the policy wonk version of being the most frequent guest host of Saturday Night Live. So I'm, I'm very honored to, uh, to have the crown, and I'm delighted to be able to come here today to talk about my new book, uh, The Road Not Taken. I, my only regret is that I did not have the foresight uh, to call it Fire and Fury and, and sell a million copies in the, in the first week. Uh, the subject of my book is uh, this man, Major General Edward G. Lansdale, who was certainly the most unusual general in the history of the Air Force and quite possibly any other military service. He was somebody who was once a legend and I think in more recent years has become unfairly obscure. And, I, and what I seek to do with the book is to, uh, is to take an in-depth look at him uh, that goes beyond uh, some of the caricatures and stereotypes, and he was said to be the model for both the quiet American and the ugly American. He was written about by pretty much every major author who has written about the Vietnam conflict, uh, including David Halberstam and Neil Sheehan, sometimes in very flattering tones and sometimes in very derogatory <laughs> terms. And uh, if you're a devotee of uh, internet conspiracy theories, you will also probably be for long, if you Google his name, find uh, this photo, which is taken in Dallas on November 22, 1963, the day of the Kennedy assassination. If you believe the online conspiracy mongers, that gentleman with his back to the camera is Edward Lansdale, and these, uh, and these uh, people being led away are not, uh, are not tramps, but are in fact conspirators uh, behind the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Needless to say, this is absurd, but uh, not so absurd that it did not stop Oliver Stone from making it the basis of his movie, JFK. Uh, G Lieutenant General Brute Krulak, who was one of uh, General Lansdale's competitors in the Pentagon in the early 1960s, had this to say about him. He said, there are few individuals in my knowledge more damned and at the same time applauded. History is going to have to portray Lansdale's real part. Well, that's where I come in. I have done the historical research over the last five years, and I'm here to give you a very brief overview of, of who the real Edward G. Lansdale actually was. He was, for starters, not to the manner born. That, by the way, is Edward Lansdale as a, as a boy, and that's uh, the rest of his family. Uh, he was not born to, uh, to American aristocracy. He was not educated in the Ivy League. He did not work on Wall Street or, or some white shoe law firm like so many of the individuals who made up the wise men who uh, set the course of American post-war foreign policy. He had a much more modest upbringing. His father was an automotive executive in the very early days of the automobile industry, and many of his employers no longer exist. They had kind of had an up and down childhood where sometimes they were flush and sometimes they were bust. Uh, Edward G. Lansdale was born in Detroit in 1908, uh, then lived for a couple of years in Bronxville, New York, but spent most of his childhood in LA and he was really a Californian at heart. He reflected the informality of California culture. He was kind of a proto Silicon Valley guy many decades before the formation of Silicon Valley because he hated protocol, he hated bureaucracy, he didn't like to wear ties, he was very laid back, uh, very low key, very Californian in his outlook. A couple of other points worth mentioning about uh, Edward Lansdale as a young man, one is that Although he was not a great student, he was a great student, a uh, de great devotee of the Founding Fathers. Uh, he loved reading about the Founding Fathers. His father had a collection of, of documents from the Founding, which he went through. And he was a big fan of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and the ideals embodied in those documents. And that would serve as his animating philosophy uh, during his adult years as a representative of American power in East Asia. The other point worth bringing out about his childhood is that he grew up at a time in the 1910s and 20s in California where racial prejudice was rampant, including against Asians. And this was not an attitude that he ever shared. I mean, I went through all of the extant uh, Lansdale correspondence and writings, and I saw no, no evidence of any kind of racial prejudice whatsoever, the kind that was very common in that day. Uh, and in part, I think this was because he himself was a minority. Uh, although he was white and middle class, 
his family were Christian scientists, and that was a very small religion at the time that was looked down upon by the mainstream of society, and so Lansdale had some association with outsiders, with minority groups, and he never denigrated uh, people who were racial or ethnic minorities, and the fact that he was willing and happy, in fact, to deal with Asians as equals also became a big part of his success in Vietnam and the Philippines because he did not have a condescending racist or ethnocentric attitude uh, towards dealing with these uh, foreign people. Now, Edward Lansdale, uh, uh, as I mentioned, was not a great student. He went to UCLA, dropped out a few credits short of graduation, and in the early 1930s, at the height of the Great Depression, he moved to New York with dreams of becoming a cartoonist or a playwright. Uh, it did not work out, and instead, like many a frustrated writer before him, he went into advertising. And he developed a pretty su successful career uh, in advertising in the 1930s, principally in San Francisco. And there he is, head down uh, with some of his colleagues. And this is one of the ads that they put out. And this is actually Ed Lansdale in the ad right there. Well, of course, as you might imagine, Ed Lansdale's life, like the lives of everybody else in this country, was upended on December 7th of 1941. And as soon as America got into World War II, Ed Lansdale was eager to get into the struggle, but uh, being over age and having a few health issues, he found it hard to get into the Army at first. So instead, uh, he joined the OSS, America's first civilian intelligence agency. He was not sent abroad. He spent the war years stateside interviewing travelers, gathering information about the areas where US troops would shortly be landing. And in the process, he revealed himself to be a supremely skilled listener. Lansdale the listener, and that would be in fact the, one of the key skills that would carry him to his greatest success uh, in East Asia in a few years' time. Now in uh, the fall of 1945, at a time when millions of American GIs were preparing to come home, Ed Lansdale, by then he was in the Army and eventually would transfer to the Air Force, by then Ed Lansdale was shipping out on his first permanent overseas assignment to the Philippines in the fall of 1945, and this is him on a, this leaky rice boat that he took around some of the newly liberated Japanese islands doing a sort of ethnographic survey of, of, these, of these newly liberated lands. And he was intensely in interested in everything that he found out about the Philippines, and he was particularly interested in this burgeoning communist insurgency known as the Hook Rebellion, H-U-K, but pronounced Hook. Uh, and here he is, there's Ed Lansdale, with some captured hooks in, in the late 40s in, uh, in the Philippines. And, but he wasn't just interested in this, in this burgeoning conflict, he was also interested in Filipino folklore and music and food, everything that he could find out about the Philippines. He kind of plunged headlong into Philippine society. By this point, Ed Lansdale was already married. In 1933, he had married Helen, a small town girl from upstate New York, and they had a couple of kids. But when he went to the Philippines in the fall of 1945, he met this woman, Pat Kelly, who was a Philippine war widow. Her last name came from her late husband, who was of Irish Filipino ancestry. And Pat was a very unusual woman for the 1940s in the Philippines because she was a single mother. She was an independent career woman. She worked as a journalist later, had a long career working for the U.S. Information Agency in Manila. Uh, she was very, uh, very uh, spunky, very intelligent, uh, and of particular interest to Lansdale was the fact that she came from the very same part of Luzon province where many of the Hook leaders were from. In fact, she went to high school uh, with Louis Taruk, who was the, the leader of the Hooks. And so Lansdale, as this, uh, uh, as this uh, newly arrived uh, Army intelligence officer, enlisted her help to take him into the boondocks of the Philippines on often very dangerous trips to meet with these insurgents because he was eager to find out what they were all about. He wanted to hear about the grievances of the insurgents, find out what the farmers thought about what was going on. And in the course of these escapades and adventures, a friendship formed and very soon that became a romance. And Pat Kelly became the great love of Edward Lansdale's life. And this is a part of the Ed Lansdale story that no previous uh, writer has ever been able to tell because they did not have access to what I had access to, which is this. These are the very love letters that Ed Lansdale and Pat Kelly wrote to each other over many, many years. And I was very lucky. This was like striking a gold mine 
for a biographer when I tracked down Pat Kelly's grandchildren, some of whom live right here in Northern Virginia, and they said, would you be interested in these letters? And I said, would I? Uh, an amazing vantage point into his thinking. At the same time, uh, Ed Lansdale's kids with Helen, his, his wife, uh, provided me with the letters that he wrote to Helen and often writing simultaneously. And I'm the first person after Ed Lansdale himself to have read both sets of letters. And they provide this, this amazing vantage point into his thinking on both personal and professional matters uh, in a way that nobody else has ever had. And I do think that you know, the fact that I was able to tell the story of, of Pat Kelly is uh, tremendously important because she was of great importance not just personally, although obviously that, but also professionally because she was somebody who really served not just as a geographical tour guide, but also as a cultural tour guide, as a cultural interpreter. She was somebody who allowed Lansdale to immerse himself into Filipino culture and to really understand uh, this, uh, this foreign society in which he found himself. Of course, I've also learned in the course of doing this research that there were some, some awkward moments along the way. For example, in 1947, 1948, when Ed's wife, Helen, and their two boys uh, came out to Manila to, to live with him, and at the same time as he was still seeing uh, Pat Kelly. And so this, was, this tested the, the ingenuity of this future secret agent to, to juggle these, these two women at the same time. Uh, he did ask uh, Helen for a divorce, and she refused. This was at a time when it was very hard to get a contested divorce. So they stayed married, uh, but they did not see a lot of each other because he spent uh, much of the, of the succeeding years deployed in, in, uh, in East Asia. And so she, in effect, like a lot of spouses of, uh, of deployed military, became kind of a single mother and, and, and raised the kids while uh, he was uh, uh, deployed in, in Vietnam and the Philippines. And of course, he did carry on this, this passionate, uh, long affair with, uh, with Pat Kelly. Now, his experience in uh, the Philippines from 1945 to 1948, uh, followed by a brief uh, uh, time at home, set the stage for his greatest triumph, the making of the Lansdale legend, which really began in 1950 at a dark time uh, for the United States. Because if you think back to what was happening in 1950, the Korean War was raging. North Korea had in invaded South Korea in June of 1950. Uh, China had just fallen to the communists. The Soviet Union had just acquired the atomic bomb. There was a feeling in, uh, in Washington that the quote unquote red tide was sweeping over Asia. And there was great concern about the Philippines, among other countries, because Louis Tarouk, the, the leader of the, of the Hooks, appeared to be on the verge of becoming the latest communist insurgent to seize power in Asia. But there were no troops to spare at this time. Washington was tied down in, in Korea. So there were, even though the Joint Chiefs thought about and drew up plans for sending multiple army divisions to fight in the Philippines, they did not implement those plans. And instead, the decision was made to send Ed Lansdale and a handful of helpers on behalf of a super secret intelligence agency known as the Office of Policy Coordination, which would soon be folded into the better known CIA. And so in 1950, Ed Lansdale arrived with a handful of helpers in Manila. And here he is at his bungalow in Manila. There's Lansdale at the head of the table. This is his good friend, Robert Shapley, the New Yorker correspondent, his eccentric deputy, the anthropologist, Bo Bohannon, and here's some of the Filipinos uh, with whom they were working. And this picture is really emblematic of the way that Ed Lansdale worked. He hated structured meetings. He didn't like agendas. What he liked were these kind of coffee clutches in his bungalow where he would sit around with a wide variety of people, uh, drink coffee, uh, chew the fat, and come up with ideas uh, for fighting the hooks. Now, the most important uh, initiative that he undertook to fight the hooks was cultivating this man, Ramon Magsai Sai, who at the time was this young uh, Philippine senator who had just been appointed Minister of National Defense, former guerrilla fighter against the Japanese. He was an energetic reformer. He was not corrupt. Uh, Lansdale saw him as a very much like-minded soul. But, you know, and Magsai Sai wanted to go, go after the hook problem, but he didn't know how to do it. And that's what Lansdale provided because Lansdale became his most trusted advisor and they went around the Philippine countryside together on inspection tours. They in fact were even roommates for a while and they became as close as brothers. And together Lansdale and Mogsai side developed what we would today call population centric counterinsurgency. Uh, a lot of the stuff that Lansdale said at the time sounds like conventional wisdom today but it was far from conventional 
in the early 1950s because he was telling the Philippine army, stop bombarding barrios with artillery. Stop killing all these innocent people because you are making more enemies than you're eliminating. The doctrine that he preached was really based on the ideals of the American founding. He said the army should act as brothers to the people, embrace the people, win their confidence, win their trust, and then they will rat out the insurgents in their midst. It may sound obvious today, but it was pretty counterintuitive in the 1950s. But that was not the only part of the Lansdale approach. Remember that Ed Lansdale was a former ad man. He loved advertising and he loved the military version of advertising, psychological warfare. And of course, he also knew a lot about Filipino myths and, and, and folklore. And he knew about the stories about the Aswang, these vampires who were said to terrorize the Philippine countryside. And so he got into his head that he would enlist the Aswang as allies against the Hooks. And the way he did this was by having a Filipino military unit take a dead hook and put a couple of puncture marks in his neck so as to give the impression that he had been killed by a vampire and thus to instill terror in the ranks of the hooks who thought that supernatural forces were operating against them. That was kind of a typical Lansdale, dirty trick, psyop type of operation. Uh, and he became legendary for that and people at the CIA would say, you know, can you believe what this guy is up to? But I don't want to give the impression that these dirty tricks were the uh, were the essence of the Lansdale approach because the essence of his approach was really political. What Lansdale understood above all was that the Hook's appeal was based on distrust of the political system. The Hook's slogan was bullets not ballots. And why bullets not ballots? Because people didn't trust the ballots uh, because the ballot boxes were stuffed. There was an oligarchy that was in charge in the Philippines and they perpetuated their power through rigged elections and so peasants who wanted to affect change and were suffering economically and oppressed by the feudal land-owning elite had no choice but to take up arms to fight for their rights. And so Lansdale basically determined to take that equation and, and, and turn it on its head to give people confidence in the ballots that they cast. And he did that by enlisting Filipino civic organizations to safeguard the vote and to prevent voter fraud. His ultimate coup, however, was to serve as de facto campaign manager for Ramon Magsaysay Sai to help him get elected president in 1953. And I was lucky enough to get my hands on a memo, top secret memo, recently declassified, that Ed Lansdale wrote to his boss, CIA Director Alan Dulles, in which he laid out exactly how he, he won the 1953 presidential election. And if any of you are interested in winning a presidential election in the developing world, I recommend this memo. It's a, it's a great how-to guide. And you know, Lansdale did everything from hap helping to write a campaign jingle and get favorable campaign coverage for Magsaysay Sai to uh, also writing his campaign slogan, Magsaysay Sai is my guy. And that be Magsaysay Sai became known throughout the Philippines as the guy. Uh, very effective. I mean, Lansdale was basically this uh, CIA operative who was uh, the behind the scenes campaign manager and he was successful and Lans Magsaysay Sai won a free and fair election in a landslide, uh, which, uh, and this was the inauguration of Ramon Magsaysay Sai at the very end of 1953. And that was the final blow uh, that killed the Hook Rebellion because seeing this honest, effective reformer get elected with the support of the people uh, basically took away any incentive that the Hooks had to fight. Louis Tarouk gave up the fight shortly thereafter. Most of the Hooks also surrendered because all of a sudden, the ordinary uh, peasants in, in the Philippines had confidence in the political process because they felt confident that Ramon Magsaysay would address their grievances in a way that had not been done before. And so as you might imagine, uh, Lansdale came home uh, quite a hero among the very uh, select and, and, and secretive ranks of the U.S. government where people knew what he had done. Here he is with, there's Lansdale and there's Alan Dulles, the CIA director who became a, a great fan. Lansdale's legend was starting to grow. He, was, he became known uh, as, uh, as Landslide Lansdale because of his success in, in helping uh, Magsaysay Sai to win the election. And this was one of the great unknown uh, Cold War victories for the United States, which had been achieved without sending a single American soldier into combat. It had been achieved just by Ed Lansdale and a dozen or so as assistants operating in secret. And of course, the, the, the Eisenhower administration was very grateful for this victory. And they thought of Lansdale as they confronted our next challenge in another 
Southeast Asian country, which occurred in 1954 after the French defeat at Dien Bien Phu. And by the way, this was a picture that I took at the uh, very interesting museum in, in, which currently stands in Dien Bien Phu, which I would recommend to anybody uh, who is interested in, in the war and the battle. But uh, as I'm sure most of you know, in 1954, the French lost the Battle of Dien Bien Phu and had to pull out of Indochina. Uh, Vietnam was divided at the Geneva Conference between North Vietnam, which would be ruled by Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh, i.e. the communists. South Vietnam was supposed to be non-communist, but it wasn't clear how on earth South Vietnam could possibly become a viable state uh, because there had been no state there before. So how do you create this country where none existed? Well, given Lansdale's success in, in the Philippines just recently, the decision was made in the Eisenhower administration, let's send Ed Lansdale. And the, the marching orders that Ed Lansdale received in, in the summer of 1954 from Alan Dulles basically word for word, do what you did in the Philippines. And so he showed up in the summer of 1954 uh, in Saigon. And he basically did do what he did in the Philippines. And the way he did it was pretty much the same way he'd operated in the Philippines. In the Philippines, he had found a protege in Ramon Mag Sai Sai. And so he needed another protege in Vietnam. And he very quickly found one in the newly appointed prime minister of the new state of South Vietnam. Uh, and that would be No Din Ziem a former minister under the French who had turned against the colonialists, who was also anti-communist, this kind of scholarly, reclusive Confucian Mandarin who was appointed prime minister of South Vietnam in the summer of 1954 at a time when very few people expected that he would last nine weeks, much less nine years, because he had so many enemies and so many obstacles in his path. But Lansdale believed he had to work through Ziem, and he very quickly set about cultivating him and building the same kind of relationship that he had done with Mog Sai Sai, even though there were some obstacles in the way, including the fact that Lansdale, for all his ability to, to work with foreign leaders, uh, was kind of typically American in his lack of linguistic ability. He only spoke English, which was not a huge obstacle in the Philippines, where most people also spoke English, it was a much bigger deal in, in Vietnam, where uh, people like Ziem did not speak English. He spoke French and Vietnamese, neither of which Lansdale spoke, so Lansdale had to work through translators, but nevertheless, he managed to build a very effective rapport with ZM, and that's Lansdale, and that's ZM at one of their many meetings. Uh, and how did, how did Lansdale do it? Well, the secret of his approach was very simple. He listened rather than lecturing. And that was not always easy to do with somebody like ZM, because ZM became notorious for his multi-hour long monologues that would bore other Americans stiff and, and would have them eyeing the exit after 20 minutes. Uh, but you know, Lansdale was made of sterner stuff. He had a great attention span and probably a pretty strong bladder. And he would sit there for hour after hour listening to ZM drone on. And at the end of that time, he would say, oh, fascinating, Mr. Prime Minister. Now, if I understand what you are saying, you're saying X, Y, and Z. And then he would subtly rephrase what ZM had told him, basically putting across his own ideas as if they were ZM's. A very effective method of operating. I would recommend it. I mean, it works with your spouse, it works with your boss, and it works with foreign leaders. Lansdale, that was really the heart of the Lansdale approach because, you know, Americans, and it was very different from what most Americans did then or now because we love to go to the developing world and lecture people, tell them what to do, and Lansdale was, was was, was completely against lecturing. He, he believed in building a friendship and listening and, and subtly influencing. And, and he certainly worked his influence with ZM, which allowed him to implement some of his brainstorms for strengthening this new state of South Vietnam. For example, Operation Passage to Freedom, uh, which consisted of moving about 900,000 refugees from North Vietnam to South Vietnam, many of them Catholics, thereby greatly strengthening the state of South Vietnam, which he did with the help of the U.S. Navy and and the CIA and various other agencies, and of course, with an, ass with an assist from uh, his, uh, his black propaganda because uh, Lansdale uh, did things like uh, uh, hiring a soothsayer to predict ill fortune for North Vietnam and good fortune for South Vietnam. That was kind of a classical uh, Lansdale psyop uh, uh, move. Now, what he was doing did not have the support of everybody uh, in the U.S. government, and one of the great skeptics was his own boss, General Lightning Joe Collins, a four-star general who had fought in both the European and Pacific theaters in World War II and subsequently became Army Chief of Staff, a good friend of President Eisenhower. 
very successful general, but had a very co conventional mindset. And Lansdale thought Lightning Joe Collins may have understood conventional war, but didn't really understand the nature of people's war in the jungles of Southeast Asia. They clashed right away. And at their very first country team meeting, uh, Lansdale was suggesting that the Philippine army needed to be expanded because it had to take control of the countryside. It had to incorporate various sect militias. This was kind of the, the, the only part of the Vietnamese government that worked. Now, Collins had a different viewpoint. He said he wanted to cut the size of the Philippine army, uh, of the Vietnamese army because he thought it was too expensive. Uh, Lansdale kept on arguing and then finally Lightning Joe Collins cut him off and said, you know, I am the personal representative of the President of the United States and you're out of order, mister. Well, at that point, uh, most colonels, when, when talked to that way by a four-star general, would, would salute and get with the program. But remember, Ed Lansdale was this inveterate maverick who hated bureaucracy and did not like hierarchy. And so his reply was, well, sir, you may be the personal representative of the President of the United States, but I am confident that if the people of the United States could hear what was going on, they would disagree with you. And I'm here to represent the people of the United States, and we're walking out on you. And out he walked out that door. Now, very few colonels uh, survived that kind of impertinence to a four-star general, but Lansdale did because he had the support of somebody who was even more important than General Collins. He had the support of the Dulles brothers, Alan Dulles, the CIA director, and John Foster Dulles, the Secretary of State. And that allowed him to override Collins, especially at a critical time in the spring of 1955 during, uh, during what became known as the, uh, as the uh, Battle of Saigon. Uh, this was a point where uh, these various sect militias were rising up to try to overthrow the Ziem regime, and Ziem sent his army out into the streets of of uh, Vietnam uh, to do battle with them, especially in the capital in Saigon. Uh, it was touch and go for a while, and Lightning Joe Collins, uh, for a time, was eager to jettison ZM, but Lansdale went over his head to the Dulles brothers, convinced them to maintain U.S. support for ZM, and as a result of that, the sect militias were crushed, and ZM emerged triumphant, and such that by the end of 1956, ZM looked like another Cold War success story, just like Ramon Magsaysay in the Philippines. And here he is touring one of the uh, newly liberated provinces that, uh, that Lansdale had, uh, had helped to pacify. And so, as a result of all this, the legend of Lansdale grew to even greater proportions. And here he is getting a medal from Vice President Nixon as his wife Helen looks on. Uh, in the 1950s, you also saw the publication of both The Quiet American and The Ugly American, and Lansdale was widely associated with the protagonist of both books. And so he was becoming uh, the least secret secret agent uh, in the world. He was becoming a very famous secret agent. And his fame carried over when the Kennedy brothers uh, took control in, in Washington. They were enamored of him. They thought of him as the American James Bond and the T. Lawrence of Asia and the ugly American. He was the, all sorts of nicknames that Ed Lansdale had uh, by the early 1960s. But ultimately his fame would prove his undoing, uh, not just because it aroused so much jealousy and, and backbiting from his colleagues within the bureaucracy, but also because it set up unrealistic expectations for what Ed Lansdale could do. The Kennedys uh, uh, were so impressed by his almost superhuman aura that they thought of Lansdale as being the solution to their biggest problem. What was their biggest problem? Well, it was this guy, Fidel Castro. Uh, how to get rid of Castro? Because after the failure of the Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961, this became in many ways the top priority for the Kennedy administration because they thought that Castro had personally humiliated President Kennedy and they were going to do anything they needed to do to get rid of Castro, whether that meant killing him, overthrowing him. They didn't really care. They just wanted Castro out of power. But they had lost faith in the CIA uh, because which had been, the CIA had been discredited by the failure of the Bay of Pigs. And so instead of turning to the CIA, they turned to Ed Lansdale, who by that point was working in the Pentagon as the director of, of, of special operations. And so at the end of 1961, Ed Lansdale became operations director of Project Mongoose, the interagency task force to overthrow Fidel Castro. Now, he very quickly concluded that the only way Castro was going to get overthrown anytime soon was with the U.S. military invasion.
but the Kennedy brothers did not want to send the U.S. military into Cuba. They wanted some kind of magical covert action solution that would enable them to overthrow Castro without risking American troops in combat. And Ed Lansdale was supposed to come up with this, with this formula, preferably by the end of 1962, uh, in time for the uh, midterm elections. Uh, and so that resulted in all sorts of brainstorms, like this was the mascot that the CIA created for the anti-Castro resistance, Guzano Libra, free worm, because Castro called his enemies worms. And so this was an attempt to turn that epithet against him. And this was a CIA leaflet that had uh, free worms sabotaging power lines in Cuba. I mean, it's cute and it's catchy, but it wasn't that effective. Uh, the one thing that Operation Mongoose achieved was to generate the intelligence which allowed the White House to learn in the fall of 1961, uh, 1962 uh, that the Soviet Union was placing nuclear missiles in Cuba. But after the conclusion of the Cuban Missile Crisis in October of 1962, Operation Mongoose was disbanded and Ed Lansdale was essentially left defenseless before his bureaucratic enemies, before, because he had lost the favor of the Kennedys. And of course, his chief enemy was his own boss, Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara. These guys did not get along in the slightest. McNamara was uh, the former CEO of the Ford Motor Company, Harvard Business School graduate, uh, kind of a numbers guy par excellence who believed that computers and arithmetic equations would solve all the problems of war and peace, and Lansdale was very skeptical. Uh, they got off to a bad start, and, and, and their relationship only grew worse from there. Their first meeting occurred in the fall of 1960, in, 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 sorry, in the winter of 1961, when Lansdale, newly returned from Vietnam, marched into, Lan into McNamara's office and dumped a load of these very primitive Viet Cong weapons that had been liberated from them, uh, caked in, in mud and blood, muskets and, and, uh, and spears, just very simple weaponry, and dumped it on McNamara's immaculate shining desk and said, Mr. Secretary, these are the weapons that are being used by our enemies in Vietnam. They're not very sophisticated, and the people who have these weapons, you would probably not recognize them as soldiers. They wear pajama, black pajamas. They don't march in formation as our soldiers do, uh, and yet, uh, they are licking our side, uh, the, the, the soldiers of the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, whom we've trained and equipped to be a mirror image of the U.S. military, because these Viet Cong fighters may be very primitive, but they have a very powerful idea that animates them. And the only way we're going to defeat them is if we have an idea of our own. If we can uh, win, uh, win uh, the allegiance of the South Vietnamese population to compete with the Viet Cong. Well, in hindsight, this was pretty wise advice. But McNamara was not receptive. He was too armored in the arrogance of the best and brightest. And because uh, Lansdale was not a numbers guy and consistently warned against McNamara's attempts to reduce the entire conflict to a series of computer equations, McNamara wrote, wrote him off as an idiot. And so uh, after the failure of Operation Mongoose, uh, McNamara was essentially free to drive uh, Ed Lansdale, who by then was a two-star general, into retirement. And this was uh, occurring at a very unfortunate time, just as the political crisis in Vietnam was growing in 1963, as you had Buddhist monks setting themselves on fire to protest the Ziem regime. And, the, and this led the Kennedy administration to conclude that the only way we were going to defeat the communists was by overthrowing Ziem, by backing a military coup against Ziem. Lansdale consistently warned against this because he said, OK, ZM has some problems. What, what he really needs is some tender, loving care. You need to send somebody like me over there to get close to him again and to nudge him on a more conciliatory path, to nudge his, his uh, conspiratorial fascist brother, No Din Nu, to the side. But let's work with ZM instead of overthrowing him. That was the Lansdale mantra because he said, you know, I know the generals. And I know they're going to be more corrupt, less effective, less legitimate than ZM. It's going to be a disaster if you back this coup. Well, sadly, by that point, uh, Lansdale was on the outs with the Kennedy administration, and the administration was not listening to him. And so on November 1 of 1963, the U.S.-backed military coup went ahead. And the next day, uh, ZM and his brother were murdered by the coup plotters. The results were every bit as catastrophic as Lansdale had warned. Uh, the, the Viet Cong stepped up their infiltrations, and the government of South Vietnam basically fell apart. You had one military coup after another. 
all the generals were replaced, all the district governors, provincial governors, chaos reigned. And by 1965, President Johnson concluded that if he was going to save the state of South Vietnam, he had no choice but to send American troops into combat. And that was the last thing that Ed Lansdale ever wanted. He never wanted to see half a million American troops thrashing around the jungles of Vietnam uh, with their free fire zones and, har and harassment interdiction fires, search and destroy missions, all the rest of it. He consistently argued against that. He wanted to support the state of South Vietnam, but he wanted to do it with a low level advisory presence, helping the state of South Vietnam to build up a legitimate government that could defend the country against the communists on their own without putting Americans on the front lines. But the, the murder of ZM made that impossible. In 1965, Ed Lansdale went back to Vietnam to try to help, this time as a civilian working for the U.S. Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge. This was not a, a good relationship because Henry Cabot Lodge had been the U.S. Ambassador in 1963 when he had overseen and in fact directed the military coup against ZM, which wound up overthrowing and, and, and killing one of Lansdale's friends. And, you know, Lodge was this Boston Brahmin who, like uh, McNamara and so many others, was, was, uh, was full of confidence and even arrogance, but had very little understanding of the complex reality of Vietnam. Now in the past, if you will recall, Lansdale had managed to go around his local bosses uh, when they had disagreed with them, bosses like Lightning Joe Collins, but that was no longer possible in the mid-1960s because he no longer had the kind of high-level support that he had enjoyed in the Eisenhower administration. In the Johnson administration, that's at Lansdale. His highest level backer was Vice President Hubert Humphrey, who was well-intentioned, but had almost no impact on President Johnson's decisions regarding Vietnam. And he also, of course, Lansdale tried to cultivate a local protege. And in this case, it was uh, Win Cao Ki, who was this very flashy Air Force Vice Marshal, who became uh, Prime Minister and then president, Vice President of, of South Vietnam. But uh, Key lost a power struggle with other generals in the military junta, and so he was sidelined. And, and, and because of that, Lansdale himself was sidelined. And so he had to, he had to watch helplessly uh, as, as, the, uh, as the war uh, developed according to its own imperatives. Uh, General William Westmoreland consistently imagined that he could kill the Viet Cong faster than they could be replaced. Uh, that they would reach some mythical crossover point. Lansdale warned him that this was never going to happen, that, uh, uh, that you were never going to kill your way to victory in Vietnam. He consistently said you had to govern your way to victory. You had to build a stable, legitimate, popular state that would be able to command the allegiance of the people of South Vietnam and defend them against communist aggression. But Westmoreland and Lyndon Johnson and others were not listening. And the futility of the, of the big war approach to Vietnam became evident uh, in uh, the Tet Offensive, which occurred almost exactly uh, 50 years ago this month. Lansdale was, was in Vietnam at the time, and he very quickly perceived that this was not some big American military victory, as General William S. Moreland tried to tell the American public. It was, in fact, a huge psychological defeat because it undermined uh, the, the the blithe assurances coming from General Westmoreland and President Johnson that there was light at the end of the tunnel. This, the Tet Offensive made clear that the Viet Cong were far from defeated. And so by the time Lansdale left Vietnam in the summer of 1968, he was very dejected, defeated, and demoralized. He saw which way the war was going. And he was not all that surprised in 1975 when North Vietnam invaded and rapidly conquered South Vietnam, which by then was the husk of a state. Now the intriguing question which my book asks is, was there another road? Is there another road that we'd, we could have taken if we had listened to Ed Lansdale? And I do believe that there was. There are of course no assurances that we would have won the war even if everybody had listened to Ed Lansdale uh, because North Vietnam was going to be a formidable adversary under any circumstances with more will to win, to win than we had. But there is one thing that I can assert I think pretty confidently is that if people had listened to, to Lansdale, even if we had lost the war, it would have been at much lower cost. We would not have lost 58,000 Americans in the jungles of Vietnam and millions of Vietnamese caught in the crossfire because that was not something that Ed Lansdale would have ever wanted to see. And the fact that, of course, the, all these horrors of this massive war unfolded left him very depressed and, and ruling to the end of his days 
uh, that his advice had been ignored. Although part of it was also self-inflicted because while Ed Lansdale was a master at influencing foreign leaders, his Achilles heel was he was not very good at influencing our leaders. And by making war on the US bureaucracy, he in, in effect turned it into his enemy and undercut his own attempts at influence. There was a slightly happy uh, uh, epilogue to the, to the Ed Lansdale story, which is that after the death of his first wife, uh, Pat Kelly, who was unmarried and just retired from the US Embassy in Manila, came to the United States. And on July 4th of 1973, they married. And this is them in the, in the kitchen of their home in, in Northern Virginia. And they lived happily ever after until Ed Lansdale's own death from natural causes in 1987. And you know, I have to say, after working on this book for five years, I, it was a very moving experience for me to visit Ed Lansdale's grave at Arlington National Cemetery. I mean, I felt like I knew him in some ways better than his own children and even better than I know my own father, uh, just because I had gotten so close to him through, through these letters and all the research that I had done on him. And I've tried to tell his story, which I think is, is a fascinating one. It's not just the military history. It's also an adventure story. It's a spy story. It's a romance. Uh, there's a lot going on. And I think it also has resonance for the present day. Uh, because when you think about how are we going to win our current counterinsurgency? Now we're in the 1950s and 60s, and at Lansdale's day we were fighting communist insurgents. Today we're fighting Islamist insurgents. And how are we going to win? Well, I would submit to you we're not going to do it through American combat troops. Uh, we're not going to send hundreds of thousands of American soldiers to occupy the greater Middle East. We've done that, tried that, didn't like it, not going to do it again anytime soon. But if we are going to win this war, we're going to do it not with American combat troops, but with American advisors. We're going to do it by sending small teams to work with indigenous allies to defeat our common enemies. And when you think about American advisors, you have to think about Ed Lansdale, who was one of the most effective advisors of the 20th century, right up there with, with T. Lawrence. He wasn't perfect. He had many faults, including his lack of uh, linguistic ability, something he was not proud of. Uh, but he was very, very effective in winning over locals and using empathy as a, as a tool of national security policy in a way that few others have done. And so as we think about the challenges ahead in the, in the global war on terrorism, I think we should think about the lessons, good and bad, of Ed Lansdale. And that's what I've tried to do with this book, is to tell the Ed Lansdale story in a way it has not been told before and to make it into a good read. Uh, I'm very proud of the fact that Amazon named it one of the best books of the month and said it reads like a novel, but I think it's a novel with a message, and I think it's a, it's a message that should resonate in the present day. So thank you for your attention. I'd love to take uh, questions or comments. This thing on? Thank you. A um, few rules on, on questions. Number one, please do wait for the microphone so we can record your question and so that everybody can hear it. Um, do tell us who you are and where you're from, your affiliation. Um, we, until, we, until everybody's asked their question, we would ask that everybody just ask one question. Um, we know that people like to put their question in context, but if you could keep that relatively short and actually ask a question, that would be great. And then finally, we would like that questions relate to tonight's topic. Um, and with that, <laughs> Although if you ask me who's going to win the Super Bowl, I might offer an opinion on that. Hi, my name is Pascal Siegel. I work at Ankara Consulting. And no, my question is not Super Bowl related. OK. Uh, That's a shocker. OK. Yeah. <laughs> so what does the defeat of the Islamist insurgency look like? Good question. Um, well, it doesn't look like what's going on today because you know, we've, we've killed an awful lot of insurgents, and probably the people in this room have, have been responsible for some of that uh, since 9-11. We've probably killed hundreds of thousands of insurgents all over the greater Middle East. But at the end of the day, there's probably more Islamist fighters today than there were in 2001. And so clearly, uh, we're not getting a lot closer to victory, I would say. And what that shows is that we still have not taken on board some of the lessons of Ed Lansdale, because I think there's still a tendency to think that just by eliminating individual insurgents, you can kill the whole insurgency. And I think what we've seen pretty consistently is that while you can achieve tactical victories, 
it's very hard to achieve long-lasting strategic effects just through kinetic military action. Ultimately, the decisive line of operations is going to be political. And the reason why you still have as many insurgents as ever, in fact, more than before, is because the countries where we're operating in places like uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Somalia, Libya, uh, name your country, they're a mess. Uh, they have terrible governments that don't function, that don't address the needs of the people, and that in fact repel a substantial section of the population and drive them into the arms of the insurgents. And so until we get the politics right, I don't think we're going to win lasting victories. But that's very hard to do. We, we, we know technology, we know how to how to put uh, warheads on foreheads, and so that's what we tend to do is that's kind of our comfort zone. And we kind of tend to shrug our shoulders at these political challenges, but I think we need to take on board the lesson of Ed Lansdale that, that these political uh, challenges are actually going to be where the war is won or lost, and we need to think about how do we cultivate a new generation of Ed Lansdales who can be effective in going out there in these small advisory teams and not just you know, teaching local armies how to shoot straight or how to fire and maneuver, or how to drop bombs, all that, all that stuff we know how to do. What we're not very good at, what we don't focus on doing, is teaching the local government leaders how to govern effectively, how to win the support of their population. But ultimately, that's going to determine the success or failure of this uh, global counterinsurgency. Thank you. Um, my name is John Dowd. I'm with the National Guard Bureau as a strategic analyst. Uh, I'm curious, uh, my background is Special Forces, so a um, little bit of background with doing some of this. Uh, what is your thought as far, when you say small advisory teams, could you maybe go in a little bit detail what you're looking at because it's, you know, you're not talking about just military. I think that's one of the mistakes we make in the past that we focus just, you know, even the small teams that go out are military based. And I'm not sure that may be the type of way we need to go in the future. Do you need like, like a dime based approach, diplomatic, informational, military, economic teams that are made up of different types of specialists? That you you know, and it's you know obviously talking about in some of these envir uh, environments you know very dangerous, but still, so in order to do that, what type of teams would you look or foresee to be able to have have an impact? Well, that's a great question, and I, I would just start by noting, uh, you know, that the army has now taken on board some of the lessons of the past, and I think under General Milley is recognizing the importance of advisory efforts, and so they're creating these security force assistance uh, brigades which are the first specialized advisory units that they've had, uh, giving greater support to this kind of stepchild specialty, which I think is well warranted. Uh, but as your question implied, uh, that's not going to be enough because you can have great military advisors, but unless a lot of their work is non-military, they're not going to be effective. Because again, as I've, as I've been trying to suggest, and as Ed Lansdale's life I think shows, uh, military action is not going to be enough. It's really creating responsive and effective government. And as, as many of you know, and uh, many of you probably have been involved in these efforts in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, kind of willy-nilly, our military forces and our military advisors have had to do a lot of non-military tasks. They get involved in governance at the local level pretty routinely, but they are not trained for that task. They kind of take it on board and do the best they can. And often they do a pretty good job because we have very capable people in our armed forces. But I think it would make a lot of sense that we would actually resource and and prepare uh, for this kind of mission, which goes well beyond the military sphere. And I think what we really need are, are people like uh, Ed Lansdale, who was not a military man in the classic sense, even though he retired as a two-star general, uh, because his background was in advertising. And he really thought about political warfare and, and, and psychological operations instead of kinetic military action. And I think those are the things that we need to have advisors to do, but I see this as a gap in U.S. government capabilities because we do have military advisors, but where are the political advisors? Where are they coming from? I mean, Lansdale did it on behalf of the CIA, but I don't see the CIA doing a lot of that today, and not even the State Department. I mean, they hire some contractors, they assign a few foreign service officers, but it's not really a, a specialty, and, and I think it should be because uh, we're, I don't think we're going to be more effective unless we we resource and, and prepare for these kinds of missions and, and really creating a new generation of, of Ed Lansdales. Uh, Jess Posey, Telepulse Technologies. Uh, is, is the key to success the establishment of a, of a counter narrative or, or a counter management? Because it, it looks as though Lansdale established a different management and then pushed that up versus getting a different message and pushing that out. 
Well, I think in, if, if Ed Lansdale were here, he would probably say that the governance, which I would prefer over management, that governance and the message kind of go hand in hand, and, you, and, and they can reinforce one another if, if, the, if the project is done right, uh, because you know, he would push, a, he would, in, in both the Philippines and Vietnam, he would push a message that the government uh, was more responsive to the people than, than the communist insurgents were, that the government would provide for the people, the government cared about the people, and that the U.S. was hoping the government, that we weren't out for ourselves, that we just wanted to see freedom take root, and that people would get a, a better deal from the government than they would from the insurgents. Well, of course, you can, you can message the hell out of that all day long, 24-7, and it's not going to mean anything unless people actually see action that delivers on that rhetoric. And that was the amazing thing about Ed Lansdale was in, 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 the, in the Philippines and also in, in Vietnam from 54 to 56, he actually managed to deliver concrete results that made that message believable. And so I think you have to have a very close sync up between the message and the action, and that's, that's when, you, when you prove to be effective. But you know, when he just had the message alone, for example, in, in trying to undermine uh, Castro, he had all sorts of messages, but none of them were effective because they weren't synced up with any kind of action that would actually result in, in, in Castro's overthrow. And so uh, I think you, know, you need to have those two lines of operation very, very closely coordinated and running together, and that's how you be effective. Alexander Posey. Even, even after the war, did Edward Lansdale do something to prevent empina on veterans who were mistreated by their own civilians? And, and after losing the war, I, we saw, I, saw, I know that the Vietnam veterans who came after the war were mistreated by their own civilians for like losing or like anything. Did Edward Lansdale come up with a solution which is either a mistake or he just did nothing. Well, Edward Lansdale certainly tried to explain himself in his retirement in the 1970s and 80s. He gave a lot of interviews. Uh, he, he wrote some articles. He tried to explain what he had done. And, you know, he, he occupied a, uh, an unusual place on the political spectrum because he was neither hawk nor dove. He was uh, kind of this, this, uh, this strange... Uh, uh, oddball on the political scene, sort of like John Paul Van, who was a friend of his, and a few others, because unlike the Doves, uh, he uh, did not believe in abandoning uh, South Vietnam. He thought that South Vietnam should be defended, but unlike the, unlike the Hawks, he didn't think that the way to defend uh, South Vietnam was through copious firepower and American combat troops. He thought the way we were going about the war was the wrong way to do it, and so he maintained his belief in the mission. Now, one of, the, one of the interesting things that came out of the Ed Lansdale, his second tour in, in Vietnam, was that one of his protégés was a young RAND analyst named Dan Ellsberg, who of course became the leaker of, of, the, of the Pentagon Papers. And I might add, by the way, that if you've seen the new movie, The Post, I was tickled pink to see this, that the very first lines spoken in the, in the movie were about Dan Ellsberg, who was out there in the boonies with the Marines while he was in Vietnam. And, one Marine says to another, who's the long here? And the other Marine answers, that's Ellsberg. He works for Lansdale at the embassy. And indeed he did. So it was kind of ironic that Ed Lansdale, who was a supporter of the war effort, even though he thought it was being done the wrong way, uh, was, was the mentor to this guy who became the icon of the anti-war movement. Uh, but Lansdale being a pretty balanced guy, you know, he was not happy with the release of the Pentagon Papers, which among other things exposed a lot of his secret operations in Vietnam in the 1950s and left some of his Filipino allies open to retribution. But nevertheless, Lansdale, uh, you know, kept up friendly relations with Dan Ellsberg. And, uh, and Dan Ellsberg told me when I interviewed him a few years ago that, you know, he loved Ed Lansdale and loved him still. They had a very close relationships. So, you know, Lansdale was an, unusual, uh, was an unusual guy in that he was able to kind of operate with both hawks and doves and not be fully in either camp. And uh, he was certainly, uh, you know, I'm sure he was troubled by, the, by a lot of the negative reception that, that Vietnam veterans received on coming back to the United States, but he was also very troubled 
uh, by the fate of Vietnamese refugees who had it, you know, uh, even worse. And millions of boat people, and he, he tried very hard to help his friends get out of Vietnam and, and, to, and to help them get jobs and to resettle and, and have second lives in the United States. But that was, that was very heartbreaking to him, and that's, that's a cost of the war that, that he was uh, very attuned to. The cost, it was not just the burden borne by American soldiers, but, the, but, but by Vietnamese. And, and remember, although we suffered terribly and lost 58,000 Americans, there were millions of Vietnamese killed, and this was something that, that affected every household in, in Vietnam. And, and many, many friends of Ed Lansdale suffered terribly as a result of, of the war. My name's Chick Feldmayer, uh, retired Army, and now a consultant. My question is, going back to Vietnam, yes, there was tremendous eff emphasis on the kinetic effects. But at the same time, particularly as, the war, as we get into the late 60s and early 70s, there was an emphasis of working with USAID to do some type of civil affairs. There were no civil affairs units as we know them today. But you don't find any capability like that in USAID today. But it seemed like every village had a, a, a USAID that would guide the military when we, we were tasked to come up with civil affairs projects. And we would be working hand in hand with USAID. Is that the type of work you're talking about with maybe a lot more emphasis that we need to look at in the future? Yeah, absolutely. And, and as you were alluding to, there was a change in the Vietnam War, something that Lewis Sorley wrote about in his book, A Better War, after General Westmoreland was relieved in 1968. Creighton Abrams came in and, and Bill Colby uh, of the CIA, who was a great admirer of Ed Lansdale, took over the CORDS program running pacification efforts. And there was a change in the war effort to make it, I would say, closer to some of these Lansdalian precepts. But by that point, it was too late because the war had already lost public support in the United States. Uh, I think you're also right to suggest that USAID had much greater capacity in the 1960s than it has today, where it's in many ways become kind of a contractor and pass-through agency where they give out grants to various private organizations. and They don't have the kind of internal capacity they had in the 1960s, and I actually think we should beef up and transform USAID. I wrote a, a policy paper along these lines with a gentleman who is a USAID veteran, uh, basically suggesting that USAID should give up their kind of amorphous development for the sake of development mission and really focus on nation building or really state building uh, in countries of critical strategic importance and beef up its capacity to do that kind of mission. It hasn't gotten a lot of traction, but I think it's, it's a good idea, and I think that would be part of the way that you would implement a more Ed Lansdale-type vision uh, of how to address these conflicts. Here. Colin A.G. with, uh, here to your right, with uh, Army G2. Um, I'm trying to envision this alternative path, and it seems to me a huge obstacle was the pervasive corruption in the South Vietnamese government. Um, and you talked about how Lansdale was well connected uh, w w with the government, uh, I, I guess intermittently. Um, maybe the, the obvious question, did he recognize that? How did he try to address that? And is this something as an outside power that realistically we could have overcome? That's a great issue. And I think uh, very often in these kinds of conflicts, corruption is your biggest enemy, bigger than the bigger than the actual foe that you face on the battlefield. And it was fascinating to me to read Lansdale's experience, about Lansdale's experiences in the 1960s in Vietnam and how much it resonated uh, with what I, I have seen for myself in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, since 2001. A lot of the same issues of corrupt sectarian militaries uh, with political patronage undercutting their effectiveness. And Lansdale completely recognized this. And in fact, he argued this needed to be a much bigger priority uh, for the U.S. government. He suggested that we needed to push the military out of civil governance, that we needed to have local leaders uh, who would be more accountable to the communities instead of these generals who would uh, get their posts through massive payoffs and then victimize everybody they came into contact with in order to make back the money and to turn their, their job into, into a profit maker. And part of the way he tried to address this was he found an incorruptible general in, in South Vietnam who reminded him of Ramon Magsaysay Sai in the Philippines, a, a fellow that nobody's ever heard of today uh, called Win Duc Tang, but at the time was, was 
reasonably well known. He was profiled ecstatically by the New York Times and uh, William Colby and, and Robert Comer and very, uh, various others thought he was the most effective general in the ARVIN, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. And Lansdale had high hopes that he could uh, uh, push this general into a position of preeminent authority and then he would clean up the army, reduce the corruption and thereby increase their effectiveness. Uh, but uh, this, this, this general, uh, Win Duc Tang, fell out of favor uh, with the ruling junta and in, in particular uh, Win Van Tu, who was the, the dominant general within the military junta by the late 1960s and he was essentially retired and that was the end of Lansdale's hopes uh, to clean up the army. But part of the reason why he was unsuccessful was that he just did not have the support of the U.S. government in the way that he had had in the 1950s because Westmoreland and Johnson and Ross Dow and these various others just didn't think that was very important. What was important to them was bombing the bejesus out of the communists and they did that. They dropped more bombs than they had in World War II but it didn't win the war because uh, in, in part because of the uh, uh, political uh, uh, favoritism, corruption and sectarianism of, of the South Vietnamese military which Lansdale saw as a, as a huge issue. Uh, thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Bolt, for this intriguing and pithy presentation. My name is Ben Lowson. I work for Air Force uh, Checkmate, the planning cell, uh, and I'm also a retired Army foreign area officer. Uh, I'm uh, with the China specialty. Uh, in my specialty, besides T.E. Lawrence, uh, our sort of uh, progenitor was Vinegar Joe Stilwell. And over the years, I've come to see in Stilwell things that foreign area officers really ought not to do in the Paul Mill realm, sort of like Lansdale. Is, appears to be the opposite. So my question is, why don't we know more about Lansdale? Why are we thinking Stillwell, Lawrence? Well, that's, the, that's a great issue. And I, I think T. Lawrence is actually a pretty good role model because he was pretty effective in working with the Bedouin tribes. But I think your comment about Vinegar Stillwell is very perceptive. And I think he got an unfairly positive press from Barbara Tuckman, who wrote about him. But in fact, I think you're absolutely right that he was kind of what not to do as an advisor because he had a very uh, negative attitude uh, towards the person he was supposed to be advising, Chiang Kai-shek, whom he derisively called Peanut. And he was constantly mad at Chiang Kai-shek and, and did not work effectively with him in the way that, that Lansdale worked with Ramon Magsai Sai and No Din Ziem. And a lot of it, I think, just had to do with personality because this was a guy who was called Vinegar Joe. He was a very vinegary, peppery kind of guy who was not easy to get along with, whereas Lansdale was extremely laid back, very friendly, very low key, very empathetic. And I would submit that, you know, if you're going to be an effective FAO or advisor, you really need to have a personality more along the lines of Lansdale and to cultivate some of that skill set. And a lot of it is just innate personality. I mean, if you're a vinegar Joe Stillwell, that can be effective as a leader of your own combat troops, but you shouldn't be an advisor because you're just not going to make friends and, and win allies in a, in a very difficult environment. And I think you're right that I think Lansdale is, is a much better role model for advisors in the future. And, you know, the question why why isn't Lansdale better known? I think a lot of it is simply his story has not been well told before. He actually wrote a memoir uh, which came out in 1972, but it wasn't a very good memoir because he was uh, very uh, limited in what he would say. I mean, he, this was at a time, by the way, when his wife was still alive, and so there was no mention of Pat Kelly, who was uh, arguably the most important person in his life. Uh, but he also sugarcoated a lot of what he said about his operations. Uh, even though he had been outed in the Pentagon Papers as a CIA operative, he still took his oath uh, so seriously that he refused to write that he was in the CIA, and he tried to pretend that a lot of these operations he was running were indigenous Filipino or Vietnamese operations, which nobody took seriously by that point because they could read the Pentagon Papers and they knew the real story. So they, his memoir had a real credibility gap, and I think what ultimately hurt him was that he didn't really lay out his precepts. He didn't lay out how he operated. T. Lawrence did. Lawrence was a brilliant writer. He wrote an article on you know, laying out the rules of being an advisor, which is still much quoted today. And Lansdale did not. And for that reason, for example, if you look at the Army Marine Field Manual on Counterinsurgency, there was no mention of Lansdale. Even though you know, I've talked to General Petraeus, and he was familiar with Lansdale, but there was really no place where you could really draw on the on the Lansdale playbook. And what I've tried to do with this book, I think, is, is to revive the story of Edward Lansdale. I hope this will be an inspiration and a role model for advisors, but also sometimes a cautionary tale because Lansdale certainly did not do everything right. And 
you know, in, in, in things like his lack of language ability and the way that he made war on, on the bureaucracy ultimately was, was counterproductive. So I think there's, you know, good and bad you can learn from, but on the whole, I think he was a, a pretty effective advisor and, and, and one from whom a lot can be learned. Uh, I'm Robert Dubeck. Uh, I was an uh, Air Force intelligence officer in Vietnam. I'm now with the State Department. Um, point out that you said we shouldn't be telling people what to do. We should be listening. On the other hand, then you, you're prescribing we teach these people how to govern. But I think the basic uh, precept is that they want to know how to govern. And it seemed to me that a lot of countries are run by mafias, uh, North Korea being the, you know, there, there are enemies, but there are supposedly allies who, where you're, the country is run by a self-serving uh, oligarchy, which really doesn't have a uh, nationalist or populist vision like Ramon Magsese. And I, <laughs> so, <laughs> I would say that, uh, uh, what do you say to that? Well, that's true. Uh, and I'm not by any means suggesting that we need to uh, try to empower uh, everybody who is ostensibly on our side because some of them are actually doing more harm than good. And if you have predatory, corrupt regimes who are victimizing the people, you know, making them more quote, quote unquote effective as we tend to do, may actually backfire because it can make them more effective at stealing money and, and oppressing the people and driving them into the arms of the insurgency. But a key part of the, of the Lansdale method is not just empowering the government, but also crucially uh, identifying and empowering people that he thinks are good leaders. And, and remember when he met Ramon Magsaysay, he was just appointed as defense minister of the Philippines. And, but Lansdale understood that this was a guy who was going to be a great reformer, but he needed help to achieve power. And so Lansdale helped him uh, to become president. Of course, in, the, in, in Vietnam, he was, did not have a protege who was as effective because ZM was not as outgoing and charismatic, was not a man of the people in the way that Mog Sai Sai was. But Lansdale basically made the realpolitik calculation that for all of ZM's faults, he also had some virtues that he, he was a genuine patriot, he was not corrupt. And basically, he was the best available. And, 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 and you know, Lansdale surveyed all of Vietnamese politics. He knew all these guys. And he concluded, you know, ZM is very imperfect, but everybody else who wants to replace him is, is worse still. So let's work with this guy. But yeah, I think you're absolutely right to caution us against just willy-nilly supporting any government that claims to be on our side, because often they're run by crooks. And by empowering those crooks, uh, we can make the situation actually worse. I certainly. The key part of the Lansdale methodology was trying to empower honest, effective leaders and trying to find and cultivate those leaders where he could, which is not always easy or even possible to do. Hi, Allison Hoosman, representing Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. Looking at the Philippines, and in light of extremist organizations now aligned with ISIS, the intense fighting and destruction of Marawi, and then along with a simmering communist insurgency that can't seem to quite go away, what are some of the key lessons learned from the Lansdale and McSaysay era that you think Phil security forces and U.S. advisors should embrace today? Well, I think it all goes back to governance. And the history of the Philippines is really tragic because, you know, one of the great misfortunes of the Philippines uh, was that Ramon McSaysay died in an airplane crash only a few years after assuming the presidency. And, you know, he might have made a difference. He might have made Filipino politics more effective and and honest and, and less corrupt, uh, but you know, as soon as he died, kind of the same old crooks took took over, and before long, you had uh, Ferdinand Marcos being elected, imposing martial law and ruling as a dictator, and of course, finally, Marcos in 1986 was overthrown, uh, and since then, you've had various governments, uh, which many of which have also been marked by by corruption. A few have been semi-effective. Uh, We've, you know, we've done the best we could to try to focus on fighting the, since 9-11, fighting the Islamist insurgents, Abu Sayyaf and some of these other uh, insurgent groups. We had a joint special operations task force uh, on Mindanao for, for a number of years. Uh, and I think they did some good work working with the Philippine army. But, you know, at the end of the day, 
it comes back uh, to the politics. And when you have a, a leader like Duterte now uh, in the Philippines, uh, he is a, an abusive, would-be strongman who was on a reign of terror, which he justifies uh, with the war on, on drugs. And it's possible that you know, he may achieve some short-term results against the insurgents, just as Marcos did in the 1970s. But you know, it, when, when Marcos declared martial law and, and, and took over as a dictator, a lot of Ed Lansdale's friends in the Philippines at the time in the 70s were very happy about this because they saw the situation sliding out of control and they thought that Marcos would really clean up uh, the polit would, would clean up this mess. But Lansdale was very skeptical because he said, you know, as soon as you have absolute power, you have abuses of that power. And of course, he was dead right because Marcos and Imelda proved extremely corrupt and in the end not very effective. And, and they bequeathed a, uh, a communist insurgency and a, a new communist insurgency to the Philippines that took over where the hooks had left off. And now, of course, you also have the, you have, you have primarily the threat from the, uh, the Islamist insurgency. And so I think it, it goes back to the politics, which again, is very hard to affect when you have a, a leader as, as brutal and, uh, and, and abusive as, as, as Duterte is. But, you know, I think we, and I don't know how much we can do in the Philippines as long as he's in power, but I think we should certainly think about how do we try to cultivate a, a new generation of leaders in the Philippines who can rule in more consensual and effective fashion after hopefully uh, Duterte uh, leaves office if in fact he leaves office. But it's, it's a huge challenge and that goes back to the, to the gentleman's question about how do, you, how do you deal with these abusive regimes that are ostensibly on your side and, and sometimes, I mean, sometimes you kind of have to hold your nose and, and cooperate with them to a certain extent. Uh, but I think you have to be very aware of the fact that uh, their own abuses are ultimately going to undercut your, your long-term ability to be successful against the insurgents. And I, and I do think that in the Philippines, the number one enemy has been corruption, and that's, that remains uh, the case to, to this day. Hi, Chris Crimmy, Marine Corps. I um, wonder what you think of the suggestion that uh, the CIA and other institutions of national security have been politicized to the point where they might be pursuing their own uh, agenda or to the expense of the administration? I mean, I haven't seen much evidence of that. I think uh, from the folks I know at the, at the CIA, they're very eager to do whatever uh, the, whoever the president in power tells them to do. I think it's not always easy to know these days what it is the president wants done. Uh, and I think that there are some concerns uh, about Mike Pompeo, who is the current director of Central Intelligence, uh, who I think you know, was, was welcomed with open arms by most of the CIA workforce, uh, but is now, I think, regarded more skeptically because he is seen as a very political CIA director who, and there are a lot of concerns, I think, at the agency that, that the political leadership is trying to politicize the intelligence, which not unprecedented concerns, but I think they are especially severe now. But again, I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't see any real evidence of the CIA or any other agency of government, you know, trying to subvert uh, the will of the administration. What I see going on in the administration is kind of a battle uh, between uh, kind of professional national security folks like uh, Jim Mattis or H.R. McMaster or others who I think are trying to pursue kind of a traditional American internationalist foreign policy. And then on the other hand, you have uh, the president himself, who has more isolationist and protectionist instincts. And I think there's this constant tension, uh, which produces a lot of uncertainty about what the administration policy is going to be. And I think, you know, at state and, and CIA and, and, and DOD and elsewhere, I think a lot of people are, are trying to figure it out and are probably somewhat confused because I'm somewhat confused and I think governments around the world are somewhat confused. There's a lot of confusion about U.S. policy because you know, there's, there's such tension between, for example, the president's tweets and the national security strategy of the United States. It's hard to reconcile them and figure out what we're actually going to do going forward. David Mattingly, uh, retired from the Navy and then formerly of uh, the J-2 in Iraq and some other places where we've actually run into each other. 
when you think of Asia and American generals, you have to think of Douglas MacArthur, and he was still in his power position in Japan while Lansdale was in the Philippines. Was there any relation between those two? Did he play any part in that? He played a small role in the, in the Lansdale story because uh, he got uh, Lansdale one of his jobs in the Philippines when Lansdale was there between 45 and 48. Uh, as you know, Douglas MacArthur, although he was in Japan at the time, uh, living in the uh, Daiichi Insurance Building and, and running Japan as the new shogun, uh, he was still keenly interested in the Philippines where he had spent a huge portion of his life, uh, you know, practically regarded himself as a Filipino and, you know, keenly had all the newspapers from Manila airlifted to Tokyo and read them every day. And then he would read all these newspapers about worsening relations between American GIs and ordinary Filipinos. You would have, you know, uh, drunken brawls and, and auto accidents and, you know, GIs showing racism against the locals and uh, causing blowback and, 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 and negative relations. And, and MacArthur did not like this. And he was at the time, of course, uh, eyeing, as he perpetually was, a run for the presidency. And he thought this would be an embarrassment to him. And so at the time, uh, Lansdale was just a lowly uh, uh, major on the Army, on the G2 staff in, in Manila. And, uh, you know, Lansdale, uh, MacArthur sent his chief of staff uh, to the Philippines to fix the problem. And he very quickly decided, the chief of staff did, that the, that the PAO, the public affairs officer that the Army had in Manila, was not doing a good job. And he needed to be replaced. And he asked around and kept asking people, well, who really understands the Filipinos, who has good relations with them? And everybody kept saying, this guy, Ed Lansdale, he really understands the locals. And so, boom, MacArthur decrees from, from Tokyo that now Ed Lansdale is the, is the PAO for uh, the Philippine command. And at that time, he was the other, you know, section heads were uh, were one stars, and he was a uh, and he was a mere major. Uh, so he was reluctant to take this job because he didn't think he could be effective, and uh, and he basically, you know, issued an ultimatum to his to his commander, who I guess was a two or three star general, and and said, you know, uh, either you're going to back me up in these if I get into disputes with these other section heads, or I'm quitting. Uh, and again, not often that you see a major. Uh, issue an ultimatum to a major general, but this was kind of the, the Lansdale modus operandi. He was a cheeky bastard. And, uh, and again, he knew that he had leverage in this case because he knew that, that General Douglas MacArthur, who was one step removed from God, from God in the Asia Pacific Theater, that, that General MacArthur himself, the five-star general, wanted him to be the PAO. And so the, the, this two-star general had no choice but to accede to his demands and back him up. And, and Lansdale became a very effective PAO in the Philippines where, you know, he, he, he curbed abuses among army troops, uh, became much more responsive to the Philippine media and explaining things, and he became even kind of a local celebrity in, in the Philippines, became one of the best known Americans in the Philippines after Douglas MacArthur himself. Uh, he did not stay as a PAO long. He didn't really want to be a PAO, but it didn't really matter what his job description was, whether he was an intel officer or PAO, or later he had this kind of amorphous uh, political advisory mission on behalf of the CIA, whatever his job title, he was basically doing the same thing, which was cultivating relations with the locals, uh, trying to spread American ideals and to, and to promote good government. And that was, that was kind of what he did, regardless of, of what his ostensible uh, profession was. Colin H. again. Um, early in the Ken Burns documentary, there was brief mention of the OSS working with the nationalists. Was Lansdale involved in that? And, and in the road not taken, is there an alternative road that would have involved some sort of accommodation rather than a winner-take-all struggle between the North and the South? Well, I mean, I, I think it would have been very hard to have an accommodation between North and South. You would have had basically Ho Chi Minh taking over all of Vietnam, uh, which would have happened if under the Geneva Convention the, it called for reunification elections in 1956. If those had actually been held, undoubtedly Ho Chi Minh would have won, in part because he was popular, but also in part because he had police state control of North Vietnam and it was a larger country. So, you know, that was the reason why the Eisenhower administration was not going to hold those elections. If they had held those elections, that would have been basically an easy exit strategy for the United States, which in hindsight you have to say we kind of achieved the same results. Uh, 20 years later at the loss of 58,000 American lives. So in hindsight, you have to say, well, why didn't we just do that? Well, 
that's evident from our vantage point today. It wasn't evident for the Eisenhower administration in the mid-50s when they thought, in terms of domino theories, and they thought that if we lost Vietnam, we would certainly, we would soon be losing uh, Indonesia and, and Thailand and other countries in, in Southeast Asia. And so this was never on their radar screen. And, and some people suggest also that we could have wooed Ho Chi Minh away from the communist bloc that, uh, because he was a nationalist and he spouted some rhetoric from the Declaration of Independence when he first declared the independent state of Vietnam in, in 1945, that that was kind of an opportunity to, uh, to create this uh, liberal democratic state under Ho Chi Minh. I don't think that was truly realistic. I think Ho Chi Minh was quoting from the Declaration of Independence because as a political ploy, because he didn't want us to interfere and to back the French in their reconquest of Indochina. Uh, but let's, let's be clear about who Ho Chi Minh was. I mean, he was definitely a true Vietnamese nationalist, no question about it, but he was also you know, a graduate of the Stalin School. He was a veteran commenter and operative. He had lived in Moscow during the Stalinist years in the 30s. He was a dedicated communist as well as being a dedicated uh, nationalist. And I think there's a tendency in hindsight, or there was a tendency at the time in the 60s, especially among the anti-war movement, I would say, to see Ho Chi Minh as kind of the sole legitimate representative of, of Vietnamese nationalism. Uh, and there is no question, he was a legitimate Vietnamese nationalist and probably uh, the most popular figure in Vietnam, but there was also a, a, a real non-communist nationalist movement. And I think most historians who write about the situation today will describe the Vietnam War as a civil war uh, with both sides claiming to represent the cause of Vietnamese nationalism and both working with outside sponsors, with the U.S., of course, sponsoring South Vietnam and China and the Soviet Union sponsoring North Vietnam. And I would not necessarily say that the only legitimate outcome was, was a Ho Chi Minh victory. I and mean, it's conceivable that you could have had, for example, uh, long-term division of, of Vietnam in the way that you have long-term division of, of Korea. And it's quite possible that if South Vietnam had remained non-communist, uh, they could today be a, an Asian uh, tiger, a powerhouse, and a democracy, much in the way that, that South Korea is. And you can argue, in the long run of history, Vietnam may be moving in that direction anyway. But I do think that they took a kind of multi-decade detour, which resulted in a lot of needless loss of life along the way. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you.